Do you ever feel as if everything's pointing you towards something? Space, time, history. I am grateful for every day we have. Whatever tomorrow brings. We ran into the corners of It is a blessing he came to me. The love we choose to make. Colonel Fraser, the time has come for you to fulfill your oath. Do not disappoint me. If there is a war, the places I have been. it would be safer in your time. You want to go back, don't you? Our family is here. You are my family. If I am to keep people safe here, I need to know what's causing their illnesses. Isn't this playing God? I swore an oath to the ground, but I will not stand by and watch my kin killed. People consider this to be the spark of the American Revolution. If we stop this fight now, America will never become America. Promise, Jamie. Promise me you're coming back. I swear it. We can't say what might befall us. Just as you give me your word, I give you mine. Stand by my hand. What kind of world is this? The only world. No, it isn't. Hi, I'm Kate Hahn from TV Guide Magazine. Welcome to the WG Festival. Today, we are talking to Outlander executive producer, Matthew B. Roberts. Matt, thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. How are you, Kate? Good, good. It's nice to see you. Um, you look like you're ready, you know, to join a Scottish clan right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's maybe the COVID beard. Maybe that's what it is. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I want to talk about season five a bit, if you can think back to that. Um, yeah. Many fans and critics felt that season five was somewhat of um, a return to form uh, in that it felt like the earlier seasons of Outlander um, that people really fell in love with. Was that intentional or was that organic given where the story goes? Uh, probably a little both. Um, we definitely did things uh, deliberately to bring um, the Scottishness back to the show. And, and I think, um, you know, we're talking with the designers and, and, and the cast and, and the writers, we wanted to bring that element back and to, to uh, cause one of the big things we'd all, always talked about in the early seasons was that Scotland was one of the characters and we didn't want to lose that completely. So I think um, maybe in, in, you know, maybe season four, we, we focused so much on the American colonies that we lost that a little bit. And so we got back to what we would say our roots of Scotland and, and we just tried to drop that in throughout the season, um, what we called the Scottishness of the show. And what is that Scottishness to you? Well, it, it, it could be anything. It'd be you know, what they're eating or what they're, they're, they're wearing. And you know, obviously we, we brought the kilt back and that was a very important part of the show. And, and, um, just with who get who gathered on um, uh, at the ridge, uh, just little elements that that you can kind of bring it on. And then plus showing some Scotland in some of the flashbacks, and I think that was very important to actually use. So since we're based in Scotland and we film in Scotland, um, and and she does a wonderful job, you know, doubling for North Carolina, but to actually you know show the moors and the highlands. Um, we looked for places to do that. So rather than just talk about um, uh, an example is Jocasta in the flashback when she lost her daughter, rather than just talk about it and tell the story, we showed that. And that was a way of bringing the Scottishness back into the show. And you also brought it back in things like Jamie really sort of becoming um, a laird again um, and, and having that fiery cross to burn. 
It, exactly. And, and, you know, we opened the season, he puts the kilt back on the, we, we treated that kind of almost like the gathering um, reminiscent of season one, where there was a gathering of people, um, you know, uh, vowed their loyalty to Jamie, just like they did to call him. So you could see how we, we started the season like that. And we wanted to kind of thread that through, um, you know, each episode or a little bit in each episode. Well, you are currently working on writing season six. Does the breaking down of the source material get more manageable season over season? There's a lot of source material from Diana Gabaldon. There certainly is. And the simple answer is absolutely no. Uh, we, it doesn't get uh, more manageable. The books get uh, more dense. There's more characters to deal with. There's, you know, remember back way back in season one, we stayed in Claire's POV for at least six, seven episodes straight. And then we got into Jamie and Claire's POV and we didn't break, uh, I, one of them had to be on screen uh, going, for, you know, going forward in the episode. So um, now that we have other characters and we're telling their stories, what, what becomes unmanageable is the fact that there's a lot of them and, and they're all interesting and, and the way Diana writes them they have uh, multi-dimensional levels and feelings and emotions and they're giving birth to other, uh, other characters. So no, I would say it does, it's not getting more manageable. Are there, what is the process you use to break down that material? Are there things that you've come up with over time that even though it might not be easy, um, kind of help you guys in the writer's room get into it? Is there, are there certain processes even very basic ones that might interest other writers. Um, well, yeah, you know, as you know, or as you know, but it's, as some of the, the viewers out there may not know, but the, the Outlander books are, are big, you know, page count wise, you know, they run into sometimes 800, 900, you know, 1000 pages plus. So what we do is we all, everybody reads, every writer on the staff reads the book we're working on absolutely and many of us you know uh, I've read all the whole series up to eight I'm waiting for book nine just like everybody else mm -hmm. and um, uh, we try to uh, break down the main theme of the book um, we treat it kind of like a river uh, the main river and then we pick out the tributaries that are uh, mainly the tributaries that actually come back to the river some of the tributaries in these stories flow off and they don't come back. They may come back in other books, but they don't come back in the particular book you're working on. So um, that's how we kind of break it down. And we put it all on the whiteboards in the, in the writer's room. And then we start individually breaking the episodes once we have, have the kind of overall roadmap. And then what we do is then we detail that roadmap and, and we put all the stops along the way um, and here's, we're going to spend time at this stop. We're going to spend time at this stop, you know, to, to use the analogy. Well, no, it's an interesting analogy. And I'm wondering if when you were working on season five, if you can recall if there were any tributaries that were big topics of discussion among the staff. Do you, do you disagree on things? Maybe this, some would think feels very important to someone, less important to someone else. Were there any ones that were particularly hard to decide on whether you're going to include them and how? This has been ongoing from the very first day I set foot in the Outlanders writer's room is there are so many emotions and passions about, you know, these stories that yes, we disagree all the time and we, we debate, some might call that arguing um, and because you want to you know, you want to get the story you love the most in, and and that's what's that's what's really cool about it is that you can see where the passions lie, and, and they're not always in the same place. And you find people that you know, um, and it's not you know uh, based on gender. You don't see you know just the women fighting for for the romance because. It's really, really, it isn't even a romance. For us, it's a love story. So, and you have, a lot of times you have the, the guys fighting for, for some of those scenes. So it really kind of crosses genders, which is great for the show. And um, so, you know, in, 
in, in trying to definely decide what ends up on screen, you have to go, what tells this story, the, the, the story we're trying to tell in these episodes. And sometimes it just rises to the top and, and, it's, and it's, those are the easy ones. It's the additional ones that you have to go, okay, this doesn't tell that story, so we have to pull it out. And, the, and it's hard, it's never easy. But you also don't just go, we're never telling that story. One of the nice things about the books are that, that Diana bounce, bounces around in story and that frees us up to do the same thing. So in season five, where we showed a flashback, um, it, was, it was in another book, but we brought it up and we move it around. So what we do is we'll say, yes, season five was the fiery cross, but we brought in elements of other books and we will continue to do that going forward because there's so much story in the earlier books that you just don't want to leave them out. And, and we've done that multiple times um, throughout the, season, the seasons and we will continue to do that, so. So if fans haven't seen a scene or a character that they love yet, don't give up hope. They might appear. Don't give up hope. Okay. They don't, because their favorite scene just might be my favorite scene and I've been dying to find a place to put it in. And I can tell you, Right, I'm not gonna actually tell you what scene it was, but there was a scene from an earlier book that I absolutely loved and we couldn't fit it in um, one of the earlier seasons. And I, I was trying desperately to get it in to season five. And it was um, just actor availability that we just couldn't do it. We couldn't fit it in. That's one of the things that I think that it's hard to convey to uh, the fans, the, the audience. I'm sure other members of the WGA understand this very, very, you know, clearly is that we deal with real actors that have lives and have other commitments and uh diana when she brings an act a character back into a book um after a year or two layoff you know maybe you're separated by two books uh it's easy you know she can just write it in whereas we have to go and find the actors see if they're available and you know we try we try that quite often and sometimes they're just not available so we have to kind of go away from and that would be one of those tributaries that we would have to go away from so we'd investigate see if we can find the characters to bring back or the actors to bring back to to you know bring the characters back to the story and we just can't and and so that's that's one of the biggest uh you know kind of disheartening things okay um well, it, it's also a series where the episode order varies from season to season. You don't always get the same number of episodes. So how is that decided? And do you feel like a longer season order gives you more freedom to dive into subplots and characters than a, that a shorter season just wouldn't have time for? Um, well, yeah, that's decided by the, you know, studio network. We, you know, and I, it, yes, the simple answer is yes, it's easier to fit more story and more episodes, you know, and um, it makes us focus more when we have 12. That's for sure. You have to really go, this is the important storyline, so we have to stick to it. Um, yes, it's, it's sometimes you have to leave out some story that you really love because you just don't have time for. And, and ultimately what that means is you don't have time to film it. And um, so that it is, you know, it's the easy answer again is it's disappointing because you want to you want to give everybody everything they want. But it also what we learned when we made season one, when we made 16 is this is a very difficult show to make. It is, you know, every episode feels like a little independent movie. Um, they're big. We're outside. We're in the weather. We don't have standing sets for very long. It's, um, and I'm not saying it's easy to make a hospital show or a legal show or a cop show. I'm not, you know, every show is difficult in their own way. But when you know you have home base and you can just run story through the ER or you can run story through the courtroom, it, it, it makes it, um, uh, I, I think, less challenging than when you have to go outside and you're in the Scottish Moors or you're walking through you know, the Smoky Mountains or the Blue Ridge, and that's your whole episode, that becomes tough to manage over a course of, you know, 10 to 12 months, because that's how long it takes us to film. So 
Well, so that's interesting. When you're in the room, you might have a, a envision a scene between two characters, and it, it, you might envision it taking place in a certain location. But is there a discussion even in the writers' room? Like, we're not going to be able to get that extra location. Let's place this conversation here. Does that kind of thing affect how you put the script together? Well, it not initially. So initially, we write, you know, just write, be big, be bold, write anything you want, write what's in the, you know, take the locations from the book, take, you know, use all of it. And, and then we get together with our production team. And we talk about there are just some things you just know you're not going to be able to do. And it's just because of the cost of say visual effects or or the time it would take to build those visual effects and you just can't do it like one of the one of the big things in season four was jamie fights a bear and you're just gonna you, know, you can't do that you know we didn't have the time to build that out in visual effects or to literally train a bear that would we could put you know safely next to sam you can't you know that is more movie where you can spend months and months and months and months doing that kind of thing. Well, we didn't, we couldn't do that. So there are moments where you go, yeah, literally we can't do that. So how do we, how do we keep the essence of the book? How do we keep that, that feeling? Because a, a lot of times when we know we can't do what's in the book, the, the brief and the mandate, certainly for me to, to, to the writers is, um, I want the essence of that. I want to feel, I want the audience to feel the exact same thing if we can get there. And so then they write, then that's the way you would write that scene. So, um, uh, but that's always, that's always, a, that always was a challenge and it will always be a challenge, you know, considering how much we move around and, and the story moves and, you know, where we're going and in, in six, you know, we got wars coming. There's always a war coming, it feels like. So um, wars are tough. War is hell, as they say. Yes, it is. Um, well, you know, you were talking about finding new ways, finding the essence of something. And I thought you did that really successfully in that season five finale, because um, you created a whole way to show what Claire's experiencing internally and figure out, you figured out how to put that on screen. I mean, it was incredibly moving and also hard to watch at some points. Can you talk about the construction of, of that episode and what choices went into it and some of those unique storytelling devices you employed? Um, yeah, early early in the breaking of the season, actually before we even started breaking the season, we we knew where we wanted to end. And um, with that, one of the things that that anybody familiar with the book knows that they're very internal. There's there's a lot of you know internal dialogue and feelings and talking. And Diana writes those beautifully. It's just very hard to translate. We always say, at least I always say, it's you can't film a thought. You know, so. How do you how do you get that feeling out um, without being expositional and you don't want to just have um, an actor just recite always how they're feeling you want to give them something to play you know against and and I think we 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 thought very early on okay this is the way you know Tony Graffia and I who co-wrote uh, the finale um, we talked about it and and uh, this disassociation was um, brought up and and we really ran with it from even before any of the other episodes were broken to get to a place where we can have Claire's inner feelings um come out visually on screen we did we did it also on episode um uh, eight with with uh Roger in the same way we needed to get internally into Roger's feelings so we did the 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 silent picture um, kind of the memory to build back where he can kind of understand what happened to him. And this was the same thing we did with 12 is, you know, Claire escaping out of, out of her trauma. And we did a lot of research and, and found that, that a lot of times, and it's not just, you know, uh, rape, it's not just, you know, uh, physical abuse, it's other mental traumas where people you, you know, are being emotionally traumatized and they, they, they or war, in, in war, a lot of uh, soldiers uh, do the same thing where they'll, they'll dissociate and, and find a memory or find a, this kind of amalgamation of memories that they put together and they create. And that's one of the things that when we 
got to prep on this episode. I, I told Gary Steele about this episode on the first day of prep for the whole series. Gary Steele, your production designer. Production designer, yes, sorry. And uh, he was super excited about it. And, and I said, I wanted to bring in elements from the past. I don't want this to be, you know, a real life memory where everything's exactly the, you know, right. I said, and I want it to change as the story goes. So every time we go into that, um, what we would call them as dreamscapes, you know, dream escapes, you know, she's, she's getting out into her head. And I said, I, I don't care if there's continuity. I want them to be different. I want something pulled in from Lollybrock. I want something pulled in from the Boston apartment, any, anywhere that you feel appropriate. And what that, what that did is created um, a bunch of Easter eggs and it just kind of built over the, over the prep of uh, that particular episode. And we, we actually deliberately do that anyway over the course of a season, we'll drop in what we call Easter eggs for the um, book fans who, who w- will you know, go back and look for them. And, but we do deliberately drop them in, so. Now, when you talk about those Easter eggs, it, is it always something in the production design where it's something you can see in the background or is it a, a line that refers to something that you might not be exploring? In Kate, episode? if I told you that, it wouldn't be an Easter egg and you wouldn't have to hunt for it now, would you? That's the fun of the Easter egg. You have to go and hunt for it. So um, yes, a little of both. I think we, we try to find very icon- iconic lines. We try to um, find you know the objects and props and and you know, just anything we can, even even um, a, a location that, that is reminiscent of something that was in, in one of the books, you know, we, we search it out, you know, we, we, we really think that's part of the fun of Outlander. And they all relate to the scene in this, in this particular scene where we're talking about Claire escaping, all of those things you're mentioning are things that would be of comfort to her, right? Well, that was the idea is that these are the things that she's, you know, she's cloaking herself in her family. She's cloaking herself in what she imagines as a time of, of safety where she, everybody's protected in this, in this house. Early in the season, there's a magazine that Claire picks up and um, on the cover is this modern house that um, is uh, in the memory. So even, even that was thought about, how did she think about this particular house? Well, she, she was reading an article about a house, a modern house. So that's how we brought that in. So if, you're care- if you go back to, a, you know, it's, it was a while when we filmed, I think it's episode five, uh, the title card is Claire's hands looking at a picture of the actual modern house we used to film. And for me, that ties the story together. That's why, oh, that's why she imagined that house because she read an article about it. So that would be an Easter egg. Okay, there's always some kind of flow through. Yes. Um, well, you're currently working on season six. Um, how has the pandemic impacted your writer's room and the writing process? Um, well, uh, we all had to learn how to use Zoom. So that, that was first and foremost. Uh, it, that became the, the challenge. We found out, you know, we working over you know eight hours a day on zoom wasn't productive so we kind of broke it you kind of broke it down a little bit um but you know we we were able to look at the scripts a little more and 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 and, uh, kind of delve into them a little more time with a little more time uh sometimes that's good sometimes that's not good you know in the sense that um sometimes your first instincts are are really good and you go with your gut and, and, and there's a reason, I think they write books about those things, you know, blink. Um, and you, you, and then you can just overthink everything as you just sit there with it. So um, there, were, there were pluses and minuses on both sides, but you know, now that we're, you know, we're hoping to gear up and, and, uh, and get going, it's, um, it's, you know, for us, season six has lasted a really long time, so already, and I think everybody's itching to get going and, and, and safely make the show, and we run into those issues that, that once again, you know, we have a big uh, cast, we have a lot of uh, supporting artists, and outs, you know, inside, outside, moving around, so 
a lot of challenges we want to do it safely. So. So you say originally when you tried to zoom and do the entire writer's room for eight hours, that was not working. So did you break it down into like four hour segments and how did you handle the whiteboard situation? Well, you know, there's, there's, uh, we send out documents uh, every day, they're updated. So essentially you're looking at your whiteboard um, uh, on, on your screen. You can share your screen. We can share a screen. We have a uh, fantastic, uh, support staff, our writer's assistants, and, uh, uh, you know, my assistant who, you know, was on the, on the calls every day. Um, they kept everything up to date. Uh, we couldn't survive without them. And um, we, we, we did originally try to do a longer day, but it didn't work. So we, it, I mean, that didn't last very long. So we broke it down into a few hours in the morning, and then you take a break. Because we found that you also had to exist in lockdown and COVID. So where, where a lot of times you would be able to just grab a bite to eat on the way home, well, you couldn't do that anymore. Or that your kids were in school or you know whatever it was, you were doing all of it now and, and you had to manage all the food and, and cooking and you know cleaning and everything that, that and so that if you were doing a, a room for eight hours, your life would kind of fall apart. So we decided that wasn't conducive for people being creative. So we broke it down to a couple hours in the, in the morning and then a, a big break in the middle of the day where you kind of get your things done and then come back in the afternoon for a couple of hours. And we found that it was really productive and because it took all the worry out and you can plan that way in the middle of the day, do whatever things you had to do. I think that um, for us on Outlander, when, when we, um, allow people to kind of live their lives, they're way more productive and then trying to just lock them down in, in a room for a Zoom room for, you know, eight hours a day. Right. And you don't want work to feel like you're trapped in an escape room for sure. Right. That's exactly uh, right. And because you, you know, had, you had a, a lot of extra time to write season six. And as you said, sometimes that's not great because you yep. can overthink things. Because there was so much time, was there more contact with the actors um, to sort of maybe, I don't know, refresh, you know, Kat's attitude or Sam's attitude? Did, did you guys talk to them? Did the writer's room talk to the actors more than usual? Well, no, not you. I mean, the norm, on a normal, you know, uh, break, you don't you don't talk to the actors of, about it until after the scripts are written. So, and we, you know, we're in contact with, uh, you know, Katrina and Sam about they they get scripts and and read them and and we have conversations about them and we, we've done that for years so um, you know the weigh in on on um, uh, the characters and you know and and you know but we didn't you know they also have other things going on too as well so you know you don't want to eat into um, that time when it's their time so. Right. Well, Sam has the show with Graham McTavish. He does. Yes. And uh, a book and a whiskey company and a lot of other things. And Katrina does. He's a busy guy. He's a yeah, busy guy. And Katrina is also, you know, Katrina's keeping busy. I know she's uh, making a, a movie or she was and it might be done now. And so, you know, they they had other things that they were they were doing. Plus, just just live their lives in COVID as well. You know, I mean, it, I think early on we found that it was very difficult to uh just block the world out. You know, there's a lot going on in 2020, um, uh, you know, pandemics and elections and just everything going on that, you know, takes away from your focus. And I wasn't, um, you know, unaware of that given, you know, when we would open, op you know, open up a room and, and you start talking about a story and you can just see on everybody's face some big news event happened the day before and you're just not gonna, you know, it's hard to be productive in, in that. And I think the world found that out over the last six, eight months. So it, it, it's, you know, for our cast, for our crew, for our writers, for our support staff, when you're worried about where the world's going, it's hard just to go, all right, hey, what's uh, Jamie and Claire gonna do today? You know, that's, that's a tough, that was a tough ask. I and mean, I think we, where I, I can honestly say, I think uh, season six is going to be um, a really, really good season. I think that um, we're gonna keep going. 
I would have loved to have kept the momentum of season five going, you know, just enrolled right into it. Obviously that was out of my hands, but I think though that momentum will pick up because everybody's so excited to get back to work. And I think that will show on the screen and the stories are, um, uh, you know, just a lot of levels to in season six. I think the fans that have read the book are going to be excited because they're going to see some of their favorite scenes and some of their storylines that they love play out. And those that haven't, um, I think, you know, hopefully they'll come along um, on the ride with us, you know? Okay. Well, Matt, thank you so much uh, for participating today in the WG Festival and speaking with me. And I know we can't wait to see season six of Outlander. Yeah. Oh, well, neither can I. So I'm um, <laughs> right there with you. Okay. Anyway, thank you, Kate. Thank you. You take care. All right. All right. Bye-bye.